Well, this week I was thinking a lot about men's ministry. I was thinking a lot about uh, men's events that we can do. And I was actually thinking about just ideas for the future of what kind of men's events uh, we can have. Because we we always want good men's events. And I was thinking one thing I, I know every dude in this room can agree with is that we all like setting stuff on fire. I was like, that would be an awesome men's event if we could just set stuff on fire. I, I think since we, all of us were little boys, we have just been like these wannabe pyrotechnicians. And we just, I don't know about you, like you're at a campsite, you just start throwing stuff in the fire, right? Because it's really cool to see the fork bend over backwards and the napkin in your plate. Like we just, there's something about us that we like fire. And one time I was, uh, I was at a friend's house um, this was out in the middle of nowhere, a uh, friend from school, middle of like farm town, uh, Ohio. And uh, he lives out in some like soy fields and that kind of thing. And uh, there are lots, lots of storms out there. And so lots of brush and uh, branches come flying. And so his parents told us like, hey, we need you guys to, to set some branches on fire. Um, we also have a couple of mattresses for you that we need to you to light on fire too. And we're just like college students. We're like, dude, this is awesome. Like, let me light a mattress on fire. Turns out that's actually you're not supposed to do that. Apparently there's like toxins or something like that that you're not supposed to do. But anyway, we stack up just this huge, tall, like almost Tower of Babel-like structure. And it's all a bunch of branches. We put the mattresses there. And we're college students, so what do we do? We, we got some lighter fluid, right? And so we just douse that thing so it's just dripping in lighter fluid. And uh, as soon as we put a match to it, that was one of the coolest fires I've ever seen in my life. Like 20, 25 foot tall flames just like to the heavens basically. It was the closest I've ever been to First Kings chapter 18 when Elijah, he calls down the fire. Like I was like, this is probably somewhat what it looked like. Um, so that was just, that, that was so, so fun. And I know that doing a fire like that, making a fire like that would be really difficult um, if it was just me and a couple of guys with a couple of matches and maybe some leaves and something like that. But when you add something as flammable as lighter fluid, it, it can make that job incredibly easy. And, and, and today, our, our topic is about prayer. We're talking about a disciples, uh, the disciples' prayer life. And so we, we look at a fire like that, and we're like, oh, 25 feet tall, man. I, I want a prayer life that looks a lot like that. Vibrant, on fire, blazing, just excited, getting in God's Word, praying, and, and praying just blazing fire, if you will. And we think we, we have this high expectation of, of what prayer looks like and what, what, where, where we want to go um, in our prayer lives. And some of you guys ha- have been just prayer warriors. You're just so committed to praying. You show up to abide. You're praying just over and over, going through these requests, praying God-centered requests. Your life, you're leading your wife in prayer. You're leading your kids in prayer. You're praying every morning, and that's awesome. But I know that some of you, prayer becomes as a really difficult struggle. You've tried it before. You've heard a million sermons on it. And you're like, oh, well, I just need to try a little bit harder, do a little bit better. And you look at a fire like that, and you say, how, how does the fire get that big? How does a prayer life look that blazing? How can I get to that point. And so today I want to, I want to basically provide some, some lighter fluid to, to your prayer life. And this isn't, you know, the, the greatest prayer sermon you're ever going to hear, but I want to give you a tool. We, we call this the Disciplers Toolbox. And so really all I want to do is I want to place a, a, a tool, a, a power tool, a, a power drill, if you will, into your toolbox to help make this prayer thing that we're all called to do as men and then as leaders, as we talked about last year in the men's ministry, we need to be leading our wives, our, our kids, uh, other men in the church. We need to be discipling them. And so if we're going to do that, that uh, starts with having a, a vibrant prayer life, a, a blazing prayer life, if you will. And hopefully today we can, we can get some, some lighter fluid for, for those of you who your prayer life is not going the way that you want it to go to, to help it get um, off the ground, to get on fire. But I know prayer is difficult. Prayer is one of those things that we are called to do. You've heard a million sermons on it. Pastor Elliot just preached in, in Colossians chapter 4 on prayer. And I thought that was uh, such a helpful sermon. To he, he, he mentioned something in that sermon of saying, if you just use your, your guilt and your shame from every prayer sermon you've ever heard, it's not going to go anywhere. You're, you're going to pray later this afternoon. You're going to pray tomorrow. And then by Monday, you're going to forget everything you learned about prayer because your conviction or your guilt or your shame or whatever you have is done. And so we need to see prayer at kind of like that, that fire. We need to constantly be putting that, that lighter fluid on. You don't just put it on and leave it, but you're putting on more and more. You're putting more embers on. You're putting more branches in. You're putting another mattress, if you will, on the pile so that it continues to build and it continues to grow. That is communion with God. But again, I know that prayer is difficult and we all have prayer weaknesses, every one of us. And before we even dive into what the solution, what the method, what the, the power tool in your toolbox can be, we need to first understand where our weaknesses are. So 
write it down this way for point number one, is you need to identify your prayer weaknesses. Identify your prayer weaknesses, where you feel like your prayer life it right now is not where you think it should be. Maybe for some of you right now, your prayer life is very robotic. It's very boring. You, you kind of pray the same old things about the same old things, and, and you, you feel frustrated uh, of, you know, why my prayer doesn't look like my small group leader. They talk about their prayer life like it's a blazing fire. What's wrong with me? You look in the mirror, you're like, maybe I'm a second-rate Christian. I get frustrated, and you, you start to spiral out of control because you feel like my prayer life is not the prayer life of David or the prayer life of Elijah or the prayer life of Paul. What is wrong with me? I've read biographies. I've, I've read stories. You know, I've, I've heard the Martin Luther quote where he says, if I didn't start my day in three hours of prayer, Satan has won the day. And you hear things like that, you're like, oh man, no way. I, I guess I'm never going to do it. I, I guess my prayer life is going to be terrible forever. And you can get frustrated and spiral down that hole, or, or spiral down that, not hole, whatever word you want to use. And you start spiraling out of control, rather. And, and it's easy for you to get frustrated. It's easy to start making excuses for why maybe your prayer life is the way that it is. And you start thinking in band-aid solutions. You hear a prayer sermon from Colossians chapter 4, it continues steadfastly in prayer, being watchful on it with thanksgiving. You think, okay, Pastor Elliot, he talked about shame, he talked about guilt, he talked about not letting my shame and my guilt prompt my prayer. It should be deeper than that, it should be a communion with God. Like, I, I did do that for like a week. I did it for two weeks. What, what's, what's the problem? What's the deal? Maybe I should just use more words. Maybe I should just prioritize quantity over quality and just say more things and just repeat things over and over again. And Jesus actually talks about that in Matthew chapter 6, right before the Lord's Prayer. He talks about how the Pharisees are praying the wrong way. Matthew 6, 7 and 8, he says, When you pray, don't heap up these empty phrases as the, as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words, but do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then he goes in from there with the Lord's Prayer. A band-aid solution is just to say, I'm going to just pray more. I'm going to just add another 5, 10 minutes to my prayer time in the morning, and maybe... I'll catch, uh, I'll, I'll catch the, the drift, I'll, I'll catch the excitement, the addiction for, for praying more, and one day I'll pray like a pastor. One day I'll pray like these biographies that I've read before. Maybe I'll pray like my small group leader one day if I just maybe add another five minutes here and there. And it's easy for us to just think of maybe big problems and just throw band-aids on them. And that's not what we, not what we want to do. And we can compound these excuses over and over again of why we don't pray. And maybe you've thought this before of, man, I, I try to pray. I really do. I put some discipline into it. I put some effort into it. And I just feel like I don't get anywhere. I, I pray and it's, it, it ends up being boring. I pray kind of for the same requests. I pray for, you know, my aunt who's in the hospital. Or I pray for that person in my small group that's struggling with something. And I do it and I do the Echo app and it's just... I just kind of get bored after a couple minutes. I get, I, it, 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 I lose track. I, I have prayer ADD and I just start to lose focus and I get distracted. And then I start thinking about something else and then boom, I'm done praying and I'm on to the next thing. And you can feel that, that frustration that Jesus, he experiences that with his disciples. You guys remember that story when they're in the garden? Matthew 26, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane there about to be crucified. He's praying there with his disciples and Jesus is over there with the blazing fire. Just, just praying so hard, you know, sweat is dripping down like blood. It's just, he, he's, he's consternating so hard over his prayers. And he shows up to his disciples, he looks at them and they've fallen asleep. Matthew 26, 40 and 41, he says, he looks, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you might not enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Jesus provides a solution in there for Peter and the disciples' prayerlessness, the getting bored, the I'm going to try and then I'm going to give up and fail. He says, you guys need to discipline yourself. You need to, to watch for more than one hour. Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. Your prayerlessness is probably, and this is going to sound very dumb, but your prayerlessness is probably related to your prayer. And what I mean by that is he says here, you guys are, are so weak, your, 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 your flesh is weak, your spirit is willing and it wants to pray, but you need to discipline yourself and say, I'm going to get up. And so in the situation, like I, I, I don't know what the garden, you know, what, how, what position they were praying in, but I, I, I can kind of picture them falling asleep by not being watchful in their prayers, not doing what Colossians 4 says, of just probably laying down. Maybe you lay down when you pray. Maybe you close your eyes and lay down when you pray. Maybe you've tried praying on your pillow right before you go to bed. And how, how well does that work? You end up like Peter in about five minutes, don't you? Because then, then you fall asleep. There's this watchfulness. There's this discipline that we need to have in our prayer life. And so Jesus, I mean, really his solution to the disciples is suck it up. 
I mean, he, 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 does, he basically says, what are you guys doing? He confronts them and, and he says, your spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You, you need to start watching and pray. You need to start being disciplined. And part of being a godly man is, is discipline. So part of this, every time you hear a person, part of it is discipline. The follow-up is discipline, is effort. It, it, is, it is effort, or there is effort involved when you pray. You can write down 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. You know this verse. Rather, train yourselves for the purpose of godliness. For while bodily training of some value, godliness is of every value in every is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Part of praying is understanding how precious of a gift it is to pray. That's one of the reasons why we pray together as a church with abide in prayer. We're, we're meeting together every night, and we're praying because we understand the preciousness of it. The fact that we get to come before communion with God, the fact that we can boldly approach the throne room of God with our request, having one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, that is incredible. And when we understand that, that's when we're able to start with the discipline. That's when we're able to start uh, to to be able to put it into practice, even when the the, the flesh is weak. 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., the flesh is weak at about that time of the night, is it not? After a long day of work, uh, after time with your kids, dinner, uh, I mean, so many different things going on. And I'm not saying the application to this sermon is just sign up for abide in prayer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the, really the application to the sermon is a lifestyle of abiding in prayer. Not just the event, but the, the lifestyle of it. And that requires this act of discipline. And so wherever you are, whether you are the semi-blazing fire, whether you are the blazing fire, or whether you've just got a, a couple of embers sitting in a bonfire, Wherever you are at right now, you need to see, I need to train myself for the purpose of godliness because you do train yourself for many different things. You train yourself for what you love. Maybe your hobby. You're good at your hobby. Why? Because you spend time doing it. Because you care about doing it. You spend time, you're probably good at your job. Why? Because you spend time getting better at your job, cultivating that, disciplining yourself. You are good at the things that you want to be good at. You put effort into the things you want to put effort into. And so prayer, it, it's, it's no different. If you want to put effort into it, if your spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak, you will push through. You will train yourself for the purpose of God in 1 Timothy 4. Maybe you thought, man, I just don't know what to pray. I've heard many requests. I've shown up to prayer nights before. I've gotten big, long lists of stuff that the church needs and requests to, to be prayed. But, I mean, man, I just, I, I sit down in the morning and I'm like, what do I pray next? What, what do I do? Or maybe you've thought before, like, I, I've prayed and then nothing, nothing happens. I don't see any tangible fruit, any tangible answers to it. And maybe that has spiraled you out of control of, I'm, I'm going to give up because I'm not seeing anything happen. I'm not seeing any answers. See, Jesus, in Matthew 6, with the Lord's Prayer, I love the way that he starts it. He says, pray then like this. He's giving them this template. He's giving them the the answer key and saying, this this is how you ought to pray. And you know the Lord's Prayer, right? Every request in there is this God-centered, God-willed request. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. All of these things are are God-centered requests, are according to God's will. And maybe you're smart enough to know, I know 1 John 5, 15. That says, if I pray according to God's will, he will, therefore, answer. He will do what I want him to do in the sense of praying God-centered requests. And so we want to pray things that are according to God's will. And maybe you're not seeing answers because you're not praying according to God's will. Another verse to consider is James 4, uh, verse 3. James 4, verse 3. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Maybe why God is not answering your prayers is because you're spending it on your own passions. You're not praying the things that God wants you to pray. And I could have got up here and we could have gone through the Lord's Prayer and said, hey, these are the things God wants you to do. And that's great. And I've heard many sermons on the Lord's Prayer before. I've preached many sermons on the Lord's Prayer before. And those are awesome. Submitting our requests to God-centered things. We want to make sure that we're doing that. We need to pray according to God's will, especially if you are going to be a leader of your wife, of your kids, of your small group, of other people you're taking through partners, of maybe a different ministries that you serve in. What's vital is, is, is a prayer life. What's vital is this, is this um, prayer life that, that's worthy of, of imitation. And see, that is a scary responsibility. If someone can look at my life and imitate my prayer life, man, I really need to kick it into gear. Well, that's, that's good if you feel that, that's, that godly grief is a good thing. But instead of that, I want to give you 
a, a method that helps solve those two things right there, that gives you a template to stay on track when you get distracted and your prayer ADD of, I don't know what, where to go next. I, get, I, I, I pray for two seconds and then I'm done because I, just, I've, I start thinking about something else or my phone I get a notification on. So the distraction aspect of prayer and then the knowing what to pray. And I think these two, these two excuses or these two um, weaknesses, they, they kind of come together in, in this solution, in this uh, tool, in your, in your tool belt. This very simple prayer method that I, I believe can be lighter fluid on your prayer life to help change not just, I'm going to pray a little bit tomorrow and Monday and maybe Tuesday, and if I can really stretch it, I'll get to Wednesday and pray this way, but really for the rest of your life. I remember learning this method, and then therefore I'm still doing it. Today, I, I'm, I'm still doing it. It should therefore result in a lifestyle of change. And so the method is as simple as this. You can write it down this way for point number two, and then we'll talk through it, how to explain what it means. Point number two, you need to discipline yourself. You need to set aside time to pray the Bible. Set aside time to pray the Bible. Those two things, staying on track and then asking things that are according to God's will. Those come at a head when we're praying the Bible. And what I mean by that is taking the words of Scripture and then therefore almost like translating them, almost re-upping them and turning them to God, turning those requests, turning the things that you read to God, basically copying and pasting is what you're doing. See, last time we talked, last month we talked about Bible study. The time before we talked about scheduling. And I think all three of these things, they, they come together. And if you want to say, oh, I've, maybe I've been reading my Bible a little better. Maybe I've been studying the Bible a little bit better. That's awesome. We'll pair these, t- these two things together and do these two things at the same time. Praying and reading, praying and reading, copying the biblical authors. Last month at the Bible study uh, workshop, Pastor Elliot got up here and he told you guys all to turn to Jeremiah 17 and to do those 25 uh, different insights. You remember that was kind of hard, right? You remember working through those and trying to, wow, I, 25, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. How do I keep going? So I'd love for you guys to turn over to Jeremiah 17 and I'll show you what this looks like. Praying the Bible, it's very simple, yet it, it is very profound in terms of it can therefore result in a, a, a different lifestyle, lighter fluid onto prayer. Jeremiah 17. I know that you know this because we spent you know, 20 minutes in it going request after request, or uh, insight after insight after insight. And now we can take that and say, wow, I studied God's word. I did 25 different requests, or 20, 25 different insights. Great. Well, now we can translate that into prayer. Jeremiah 17, uh, 5 through 8. This is a great text to pray. After we've studied it, after we've taken insights, now we go, we translate it to prayer. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes his flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert, shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is, is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends its root out by the or roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaf remains green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Last time you sat here and you just read, you studied it. Now how do we turn that in, into prayer requests? Using this as kind of our bumpers. You think of when we, you go bowling, maybe not, hopefully not you're doing this anymore. When you go bowling, there's an option to throw the bumpers up. When we take a text of scripture, we're throwing bumpers up on our prayer to keep us on track. So you throw a, a, a bad, um, you know, eight pound ball because you're still rolling with eight pound balls and you throw it bad, you throw it right. Well, don't, don't worry. You, we've got a bumper to, to bump it back left. And if it goes too far left, you can bump it back right. If we root ourselves in Scripture, we, we start here. We go Jeremiah 17. We take verse 5. Curse is the man who trusts in man. We read that. We do insights on it. We study it. What does it mean? Okay, well, now I can turn it devotion and say, wow, curse is the man that trusts in man. God, oftentimes I can be one that can trust in Man, I can trust in myself. Oftentimes I can do that. Maybe at at my job, I can trust my own strength. I can trust my own skill set. And God, I don't want to do that. I don't want my trust to be in man. I don't want my flesh to be my own strength. God, I need your strength. And then therefore you can go down a full tangent down that road. And then when you 
finish every request you can think of that kind of applies to that verse, then guess what? You've got another verse. He's like a shrub in the desert shall not see good come. You go through that. Then verse 7, blesses is the man who trusts in the Lord. Oh God, I want my trust to be in you. God, help me as I go about my day that I might be able to put my trust in you in terms of I'm able to now obey you. I'm able to now do what you tell me to do because my trust is in you. And therefore, when I do that, I'm like this tree planted by water. God, thank you for that, that I can be steadfast. And I can only be steadfast because I believe, I trust, I have faith in a steadfast God. And then you go down a rabbit hole of God's attributes. There's so many different, I mean, we talk about tangents as such a bad thing. And in small groups or something like that, tangents are a bad thing. When you're praying the Bible, tangents are a good thing. Where where we go down, maybe you go this way, maybe you go that way, maybe you go this way, maybe you go that way. But then, oh, I'm done. I, I reach the end of the tangent. Boom, I'm back to the next verse. So regardless of what comes to mind, this is so different than Bible study. This is very different than Bible study. It's not, I'm getting the interpretation and I'm, I'm working through the hermeneutics. I'm working maybe through the, the flow of the argument. It's not necessarily that. It's taking what you see here and then translating it there in, into prayers. I, I've heard an, heard an example of this. Of you, you, know, you read a verse like, um, you know, it, God, if you would mark iniquity, who could stand? And you could go down a tangent of talking about your sin, talking about forgiveness. But you could also, you think Mark, and you think about your friend named Mark, and you start praying about Mark. And see, in Bible study, you're way off. That's totally wrong, right? It's not, the verse is not about your friend Mark. It's about God marking iniquity. And so you can't do that in Bible study, but you can do that in your prayers. Start so you using every little thing you see here to keep you on track, to keep you praying the things of God. When you do pray the Bible, it, 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 keeps, you, it keeps you on track. It keeps you from that, that prayer ADD, if you will, because the Psalms never end. The Bible never ends. You can keep going back over and over again, and this can become a daily habit of yours for the rest of your life to, to turn what you learn in Scripture what you've studied, the insights that you've learned, and then you turn it there to God. And maybe you've got a prayer um, uh, habit right now. Maybe you're a prayer journal person. Maybe you're a prayer list person. You've got an Echo app and, and you're praying through requests. Well, you can use God's word to their, then that, their, therefore pray those requests. You can turn any request of, I'm thinking about my friend named Mark, and I'm praying about his life over here, and I'm filtering that through scripture. And again, when we do that, we're, we're praying the things of God. The Psalms are especially the greatest place to go, and we'll go there um, here in a couple minutes. But I think about all of the, the variety of topics that you get in the Psalms. All the variety of topics. I think about, for example, Psalm 19. Maybe you know Psalm 19. Psalm 19, in many ways, is kind of all over the map. He starts off by talking about creation. And boom, you spend five, ten minutes praising God for his creation. Praising God that the heavens declare the glory of God. You start pr- praying about the glory of God. You start blessing God. That hallowed be your name aspect of the Lord's Prayer. And then he goes on and he starts talking about Bible reading. Seeking it like silver. And it's, it's more valuable than anything else. You start praying about God revealing himself in his word. You start praying about your Bible reading. And then from there he goes on to, to other things. He starts talking about sin. He starts talking about, God, keep me from presumptuous sins. Forgive me of my sin. And then he finishes uh, Psalm 19 with this, the, this conversation about, may the, the words and meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. What a great prayer request you could pray every day. That, that verse right there. And see, when you pray the Psalms, you start praying about things maybe you wouldn't otherwise pray about. It gives you new ideas. It gives you new concepts. It gives you new uh, directions to go. Oh, yeah, but I've, I've read the Psalms before and there's so many weird Psalms too. There's so many weird psalms. There's psalms that say, like, dash these infants' heads to pieces. And there's these imprecatory psalms where he's, David's calling out judgment on God's enemies. How do I pray stuff like that? Well, any part of Scripture, I, I would argue that you can pray. Even the imprecatory psalms. Maybe you're not praying for your neighbor to have their infant's head dashed to pieces, but you're praying about God's justice and how God will come back. Your kingdom come. Like... Like uh, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. You're praying that God's justice would reign, that the world around us would see the justice of God so that they don't have to experience God's wrath. And then you start praying about your non-Christian friend. And then you go on a tangent of praying about their life. There's so many different areas. It's like a root system under a tree of so many different areas that you can go when, we, when we're praying the Psalms. We see so many examples of this in Scripture. You can uh, write down Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, the, the church is, is uh, getting together and they start praying the Psalms. You think 
also about the command to, to, to teach one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's this aspect of using these psalms to, to, to learn from each other, but then also to, to therefore pray them to God. This may not be the greatest example in the world. You can also write down Jonah chapter 2. Jonah's not the guy I'm going to tell you model your life after and imitate Jonah. Do everything Jonah does. But Jonah in chapter 2, he knows the Psalms enough to sit here and go on a hit parade of all the different popular Psalms. Why? Because he has them in his head. And I'm not going to tell you, we're not going to get into Jonah right now. But I am saying he had it in his head. He had it in his heart so that there was, a, there was something to draw from. There was something to do from there. Praying the Psalms every day. And part of this is setting aside time to do it. Part of this is scheduling time to pray. And so in the morning, when you are reading your Bible, hopefully you have a scheduled time now, after we talked about it last week, a scheduled time to, to, to read and to study, to dig into God's Word. That's awesome. Well, now let's pair that together with prayer. Let's pair that together with, with both of the spiritual disciplines, Bible reading and prayer. It's such a great opportunity to pray God's Word every day if you're doing the every day in the Word. Right now, we're kind of finishing up the Psalms, but any text of Scripture you can pray. The Gospels, you can pray about Jesus and imitating Jesus. Paul's letters, Paul prays all the time for different people. We can copy those prayers in our life. Maybe you read Old Testament, you read stories like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being faithful. Wow, God, help me be like these guys. Asking God for these prayer requests that maybe you otherwise wouldn't think of off the top of your head, or maybe they're not written down in an Echo prayer app with your small group, but they're things that are all throughout Scripture that you can turn, translate to praying before God. Part of this is setting a plan, making, setting aside time and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Question number four on the back of your worksheets, you're going to talk with your small group about what your plan is every morning, every night, whenever you do your quiet time, your Bible reading and prayer, setting aside time and saying, I'm going to pray for this long. I'm going to read my Bible for this long. I'm going to read this Bible reading plan or whatever it is. You have to make a plan. Going back to 1 Timothy 4, train yourselves for the purpose of godliness. For this training is of every value. Bodily training is only of some value. Disciplining ourselves, setting aside time, saying from this time to this time, I'm going to pray. We're going to talk about that in small groups here in a couple of minutes. But to be a discipler, to, to look to other people and to pull them along so that you can say, ah, you can imitate my prayer life. Part of that is this aspect of discipline. Part of this is scheduling time to pray and to pray the Bible. This has been something in my life that I have done in my prayer life and it keeps me on track. It protects me from prayer ADD. It, it gives me things to pray maybe that I wouldn't otherwise think of. It is so helpful when you set aside time to pray. But part of being a discipler is not just setting aside time to pray, but responding to the different things in life that prompt you to pray. See, it's oftentimes, in, or it's oftentimes when life or you're going through a season of difficulty in your life to constantly be on your knees and to pray. And I'm sure you've experienced that before. If you, God has brought you through a trial, you probably look back and say, wow, I prayed a lot during that time. Someone that is devoted to prayer is doing that and is scheduling time in the morning. And part of the Psalms is, is there's so many different kinds of Psalms that it, it really, one of my professors used to say that every sigh of the soul is in the Psalms. Every sigh of the soul. Every situation that you have in life. I'm sure there's some Psalm that you can root this back to uh, a God-centered, a God-willed prayer request keeping you on track. And so if you're going to be a discipler, you need to not only schedule time to prayer, but you need to also respond to life by praying the Psalm. So write it down this way for point number three. Respond to life by praying Psalm dot, dot, dot. I'm going to give you a couple of Psalms, more than a couple of Psalms, of when life is going like fill in the blank, you should turn to this Psalm and to, to pray it. See, First Thess chapter 5 says that we need to be rejoicing, always praying without ceasing. There's this aspect of at all times we, we, we should be constantly going back to prayer. I quoted it earlier, but uh, Colossians chapter 4 verse 2, continuing steadfastly in prayer. A lifestyle of prayer devoted to prayer is what we want to do. And so part of doing that is pouring on this lighter fluid of keeping it, connecting it, marrying it with our Bible reading. So I'll give you a little Psalm treasury index, if you will for situations in life in which psalm to turn to. The first one, I'd love for you to turn to uh, Psalm 34. The first thing that you can do is, well, you can respond to life by praying Psalm 34. You can write that down as the first subpoint if you'll go into Psalm 34 when you worship. This is something that we need to be doing each and every day. Not necessarily Psalm 34, but using maybe different psalms to, to allow you to praise God. And right now in the month of November, our whole world is thinking about thankfulness. 
And right now our world doesn't really know who they're being thankful to. You as a Christian, you do know who to be thankful to. But part of this worship aspect is not just being thankful to God, not just saying, God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my house. But this is what Jesus taught us. Pray then like this, Father, hallowed be your name. There's this aspect of worship, of blessing God, of glorifying God. And Psalm 34 is a great example of that. If you go to Psalm 34, you see what this looks like. He starts off Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Man, I can turn that into a prayer request so easily. God, I, I do need to bless you at all times. I, need to, need, I do need to go beyond just thanking you for the things of my life and putting together a thankful list. That's a great thing to do. But why am I thanking God? Oh, well, God has given me this. It's rooted in his character. I can bless him. I can glorify him. I, I, I should, his praise shall always continually be in my mouth. God, forgive me for my thanklessness. Forgive me from, for when times are good, I'm not involved in prayer as much as I am when times are bad. God, I, I, I'm sorry for that. May your praise continually be in my mouth today as I go about my day at work. Please help me to think about you often. Help me to meditate on your word. Help me to think about your character, blessing you at all times, that my work ethic would be one that blesses you at all times. Do you see how there's so many avenues, deep avenues, deep tangents. Tangents are a good thing. Deep tangents to go when you start praying the Psalms like this. And you can pray the same old things, the same old requests about maybe the people in your small group or family members or the non-Christian you're trying to invite to church. You can all pray those through verses like this. Verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. God, I've seen you answer my prayers before. I want to thank you. And I want to now bring this request to you because I know you are a God that hears my prayers and answers them. And then boom, 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 boom. There's so many avenues that we can go about by praising God. I'm sure you've heard it said many times before. Before you start going into requests in your prayer life, you you want to stop and first and praise God for, for something. Praising God for his attributes, blessing the Lord at all times, making sure that his praise is continually in your mouth. There's a million of these Psalms. Psalm 24, Psalm 29, Psalm 32, 35, 66, 100, 103, 104. Really from like 120, like probably 119 all the way to the end. I mean, there's so many examples. If you open up your Bible, open up the book of Psalms, there's probably some psalm on the page that you're looking at where they're presenting their thanksgiving, their blessing, their, their praise, their glory to God. And this needs to be something that should be a part of our life every day. And if you go more towards the end of the book of Psalms, you'll see a lot of that. So the 120s, the 130s, the 140s, and then the 1150 that we have. Those are a bunch of examples. Maybe you know Psalm 103, bless the Lord at all times not forgetting any of his benefits, forgiving my iniquity, healing my, all of my diseases, redeeming my life from the pit. There's so many things to be thankful to God for, but then also to be praising God for. Those two things are, are different. I wish we had more time to get into that. But Psalm 34 is a great start. And Psalm 34 has got, what, 22 verses? If you spent really good quality time in 22 verses, that could take you an hour. That could take you two hours. I don't know. There's so many tangents that you can go to praise God here in Psalm 34. But I know that life gets hard oftentimes, and there's many psalms that talk about when life is hard. Write it down for the second one is Psalm 42. Praying Psalm 42 when, when, life is, when life is difficult, when life is hard. Psalm 40 is a great one as well, but Psalm 42. Maybe you know this one, maybe you've prayed this one before. It starts at the beginning of talking about one's need for God. And maybe when life is difficult, you feel this need. And you feel, wow, I, I am like, verse 1, a deer that pants for flowing streams. My, pa- uh, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When I shall come and appear before God, my tears have been my food all uh, or day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with cloud shouts, songs of praise, and multitude keeping thanksgiving. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Maybe you've gone through trials like this before where Psalm 42 just comes off the page like it's highlighted and bolded and you can sit here and you can pray those five verses for an hour long because, wow, there is so much in here. And I love Psalm 
uh, 42 verse 5, and he says, he says, why is my soul cast down within me? He talks to himself, and part of, part of praying this is, is talk, even talking to ourselves. Martin Lloyd-Jones, if you know who this is, um, he's a preacher in the, the 1900s in, uh, in Wales and then also in London, and he would say, a good Christian is a schizophrenic. And, 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 and I, love that. I love that picture of a good Christian is a schizophrenic. What he means by that is always talking to themselves. And part of the Psalms is we're talking to ourselves. We're praying, God, my soul, why are you cast down within me? I, I need to hope in God. I need to trust God. Why? Because I look at all of these things in Scripture. I see how faithful God is. Boom, rattle, rattle, rattle down a bunch of attributes of God, all of his faithfulness, a story that you read in Exodus, a story that you read in Judges, a story that you read in First Kings or Second Kings. There's so many examples of that. And you can go just forever by going down the rabbit trail of Psalm 42 when life is difficult. Other Psalms to, uh, of crying out when life is difficult, Psalm 3, Psalm 6, 7, 13, 23, you know that one, 37 is another good one, 40 is another good one as well. These are more at the beginning, I guess. The praise ones are more towards the end and more likely. And then the beginning is much more um, this this aspect of life is hard. But if you notice, every psalm, in, in the beginning, it's kind, it's kind of the same progression, right? It starts with this frustration. It starts with this confusion. It starts with this, why are you cast down on my soul? And then always it gets to that end, hope in God. And when life is difficult, what a better prayer request to pray right there. I, 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 I go from the lamenting, I go from the difficulties of life to I need to hope in God for I shall again praise him. Another one that you can turn to, just a couple more pages to the right, is Psalm 51. Psalm 51, when you sin, is a great one to turn to and to go to confession. And God, you write that down for the third one. Psalm 51, when you sin. Praying Psalm 51, when you sin. What a great psalm of confession. This is David confessing his sin after he had adultery with Bathsheba and then killed her husband. Starts off, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. God, I, I, I've messed up. I have sinned. But God, according to your mercy, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, God, blot out my transgressions. A great paradigm to follow here is that he's confessing his sin before God, but then he's rooting every confession to an attribute of God as well. Do you, do you see that? He's, he's giving God a reason to forgive him. He's saying, God, please forgive me because I know you are a good God. I know you are a faithful God. I know you are abundant in steadfast love. I know you are abundant in mercy. Verse two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Why? Because I know you are a merciful God. I know you are a steadfast God. And again, that's where we see our Bible reading, our Bible study, and our prayer come together as one. Those two things are together. And we see this progression here of confession. This is a great progression that you should have when you do confess your sin. Asking God for mercy. Asking Him to forgive our iniquity. Verse 10, creating in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold of me an, uh, uphold me with a willing spirit. There's, there's this aspect of when I'm praying confession, I'm getting to verse 12 eventually and I'm asking God for this, this help to, to repent. This help to turn around from the sin that I was doing, confessing it or forsaking it after confessing it and then now turning a different direction. Praying for repentance. How often are we praying for repentance? Psalm 51 gets us to think that way. And then verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways I, and sinners will return to you. Then now I can be effective for you once I confess my sin and you forgive me. What a New Testament idea that is too. How much are you going to do for the kingdom? of How much discipleship are you going to do in life if there's sin on your account? Psalm 51, asking God for mercy, asking him for forgiveness, confessing our sin. Then verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways. Then therefore I can be useful. Psalm 51 is a great one to pray when you do sin. No, we're running out of time. You write down the fourth one, Psalm 73, when you're frustrated. This one is long. But if you know Psalm 73, you know the progression there of Asaph. He's frustrated. He's jealous. He's coveting. The, 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 why, why is our world so broken and why are they succeeding? Maybe you've had that thought. You've had that sigh of the soul before. And present and taking those maybe frustrations that you have about our world, 
or about you know the things you're seeing in Washington D.C. Taking those frustrations that you see and then that, therefore translating it to to hoping in God. We see the progression in Psalm 73. He gets to the end of it. The the last verse is, is incredible. He says, "But for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all of your works." You could pray that verse right there for a long time, and that would be God centered. That would be God willed, and you would stay on track right there. Psalm 73. The next one, pairing Bible reading and prayer, Psalm 19. You know this one. We don't have time to do this whole, one, this whole thing. But Psalm 119, longest chapter, longest psalm in the, in the the book of Psalms, but also the longest chapter in Scripture, 176 verses. But every time my Bible reading is dry, I go back to Psalm 119 every single time, and I present these requests to God. God, please. Like uh, verse uh, 18 I love this one. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your life. Give me this idea. Give, give me this desire. Give me this wisdom to, to see the great things from your law. Verse 15, I'll meditate on your precepts. Fix my eyes on your words. God, help me as I read my Bible to be able to put it into practice. Help me not be a hearer of the word, but a doer instead. Last one I have for you is Psalm 131. This is one of my favorites. Psalm 131. It's just three verses long. But when... You are anxious when you're anxious, especially about the future. What's going to happen in the future? Write this down, Psalm, or pray Psalm 131 when you're anxious. Love this one. The psalmist says, My heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me, but I've calm and quiet in my soul like a wean child with its mother, like a wean child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time forth, forevermore. Praying that right there when you are anxious about the future. I mean, that right there is the lighter fluid. That right there is the bumpers. God, I don't want my heart to be raised up too high. I do not want to occupy myself things too great or too marvelous for me. God, I know you are in control. I know I am not in control. I know I'm dependent upon you like a wean child uh, with its mother, like a wean child is my soul within me. God, I need to hope in you. And therefore, then using Psalms, using the, the pages of Scripture, using the revelation of God, therefore to translate it, turn it around, when life gets hard, when life gets anxious, when you're frustrated, when you're bothering your stale, whatever the case may be, turning those around, presenting those requests to God. And what good is this whole workshop thing if we don't even give it a try? So right now, I think you've got about 10 minutes, about 10-ish minutes. And I want you to pray Psalm 23, one that you probably know very well. Maybe you have it memorized. Walk through Psalm 23. Pray it. The Lord is my shepherd. Man, you could, you could pray that right there. God, be my shepherd. Be my friend's shepherd. Be this person I know who's going through a trial. Be their shepherd. Again, we could spend another hour going through the book of Psalms, but I would love for you guys to try it. Psalm 23, get, get in your feet wet, and then we'll break up into small groups in about 10-ish minutes, 5 to 10-ish minutes. So Schrader will be up to tell you when to do that. But right now, just spend some time praying, meditating there on Psalm 23, and we'll see if we can learn anything from it.